We have the pleasure of having with us uh, Declan Brady, the Honorary Secretary of uh, CEPIS, the Council of European Professional Informatics Societies, and uh, from the Irish Computer Society. This talk will be about ethics, IT professional pillar or pillory? Question mark. 40 minutes. Good morning. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, like um, Simon, I regret I speak no Italian. Uh, but since probably none of you speak any Irish, uh, we'll split the difference. Uh, I'll speak in English and we'll see if we can cope uh, from there on. Um, first of all, I suppose I need to say who I am and, and what I do here. Um, I represent an organization called CEPAS, the Council of European Professional Informatics Society, and its honorary secretary, which is a role full of responsibilities, but unfortunately lacking in any kind of money. Never mind. Um, what CEPAS is, it's an umbrella body. It represents the member societies for IT professionals that exist in 33 different European countries uh, to Europe. Um, and on that basis, uh, CEPAS represents the interests of probably around a half a million IT practitioners throughout Europe. And what are we there to do? Well, we want to help our members to uh, improve and promote high standards uh, in informatics. Uh, and we want to help to foster the development of the use of IT, the information society. Uh, in Europe. Now naturally, and hence I suppose my presence here today, high standards have ethical implications. There are other implications as well, training and education and research. But one of those aspects is going to be ethics. There are various areas that we focus on in order to deliver that, that mission. We look at professionalism, we look at education, digital business literacy. Uh, green, the environment, uh, women in IT, I see many women here today, it would be great if we had more uh, working in IT, and of course research development and uh, innovation. And uh, we're based in Brussels to be close to the Commission for our uh, representation. Um, I'll just skip past that, and this, this, is, this is how we picture what it is that we do, this is what we call our house. Okay. And as you can see on that, the professionalization of IT, in other words, to try and create um, for IT practitioners a profession that is, if you like, perhaps not the same as, but equivalent in standing to the more established professions like the law, or like medicine and so on, so that uh, we better understand our career structures and the supports that we have and where we can go and what tools are available to us um, as we go through. Um, we do a lot of things with the European Commission. Um, we've co-organized various conferences with them. We do a lot of uh, lobbying. We work on uh, projects. Um, the most recent one of those is the, the last one here which was a major study that we did into e-skills and IT, ICT professionalism. And that project was around the idea that there should be a framework to help the ICT profession to define itself. And I'll talk a little bit about elements of that uh, as I go through um, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, if you don't know CEPAS, then at least you might know this thing called the ECDL. So CEPAS is the, is the father or the mother of the ECDL, and it's one of the aspects that we focus on uh, in order to deliver on our mission. Yeah? Um, to some degree, from my perspective, the ECDL is quite selfish, because the more, the more we have the general public understanding the use and how to take advantage of ICET, to some degree, the easier my job becomes. Um, but one of the things that we want to do with the ECDL, of course, is to close the, what we call the digital divide, the difference between those people like us here today who are very comfortable with the use of IT in our day-to-day -day lives 
and the many millions of people who still exist, for which that is uh, a challenge. Now, from my perspective, this, I suppose, to some degree, is, is, is my baby. I chair the task force on professionalism that I have done for the last several years. And this is a small body taking participants from all around Europe, including here in Italy. And we're examining the whole question of the profession, um, what that means, what it means on a pan-European basis as well as on a local basis. Um, we had our first presentations at an EU conference in Thessaloniki in 2008, and we've been working on various things uh, ever since. We've created an action plan for ICT. Uh, one of the outputs of that was a thing called the Professional E-Competency Survey, which we did uh, with the assistance of uh, IDECA here in Italy, and that allowed us to examine uh, various aspects of the profession, including the, uh, the closeness between what people are doing in their day-to-day -day jobs and the e-competency framework, which is a kind of a skills definition that's being promoted at EU level. And then, of course, uh, this e-skills and ICT professional is So, I am not an expert on ethics. Except in so far as I am an IT professional, I'm a computer scientist by background, I have to face various questions and conundrums that ethics pose me, but I'm not a philosopher, I haven't done courses in philosophy and so on. So what I'm going to talk to you today about more than anything else is what Sipa's perspective is on this question, why we're interested in it, uh, and I suppose I'm also going to end up asking you a lot of questions, and I'm going to be doing that, I suppose, rhetorically. I want to raise these questions in your mind because at some point during my particular journey as the, as the chairman of this task force, I have to try and seek answers to these questions. And I hope that you know, people such as yourselves who are getting together to look and to study these questions will be able to help me answer these questions uh, for, for CEPAS. Um, so why did I choose this title? Um, I presume uh, people are familiar with the idea of what a pillory is. Does it translate into Italian? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and, and I'll also come back to the, I mean, uh, the eagle-eyed of among you might notice that my pillar is actually a pedestal, which raises a whole different set of questions. Um, <coughs> But anyway, I'm going, to, I'm going to just have a brief digression on the question of the pillory, right? So the pillory has been around a long time, okay? And in actual fact, the word, I know that the English word pillory comes from an old French word, glory, which comes from an actual pillar. So I'm actually asking about a different sort of pillar, yeah? Uh, but what, what was, what is, what was a pillory? Well, a pillory was the thing that sat in the centre of the village and when somebody broke the rules they were strapped into it and people were able to amuse themselves. It was like going to the races or turning on Sky News for the television or something. You could entertain yourself by going down to the centre of the village and throwing vegetables at whoever happened to be stamped into the pillory. Yeah. Um, various variations on this did exist so you could be pilloried together with your spouse or partner or whatever. Uh, and in fact, um, you could actually do a useful work in the pillory that could force you to walk around in circles and create power to, to do various things. At the end of the day, though, a pillory was a device specifically designed to either merely humiliate the offender, yeah, or in certain circumstances uh, to cause that person to have the loss of their livelihood. So I'm putting this question against the question of codes of ethics. Yeah? We already spoke about in, in Simon's uh, presentation earlier, the idea that there needs to be, you know, a, a code of ethics or the existence of ethics in its own right 
what, what does it do? What does it do? And that's we are also concerned with what happens in the event that somebody violates these ethics. What happens if the ethics aren't upheld? What happens when we see situations where uh, we're not obeying these ethics? There has to be some sort of sanction. So what is the nature of that sanction? And I'm using the example of the pillory to illustrate this sanction because on the one hand there's the question of punishment or the threat of punishment at least but on the other hand there's the threat that by but by giving ourselves a formal standard and making that standard open and accessible to other people that somehow we can be putting ourselves on a pedestal bring me back to my first question uh, and held up in, 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 in ways that perhaps we might not miss, we might not meet. But perhaps that speaks to some degree of the bravery that uh, Simon referred to as well. That we do have to uh, consider that. I also wanted to throw up this picture of the pedigree just to show to you that it's not the Japanese in IT that first developed micro miniaturization. So people who punish people develop this. This is, this is a finger pillory. And you could be strapped into this thing and it held you just as tight, but obviously it didn't require anything like the materials or the resources that were needed for a full scale pillory. So let's get back to the topic at hand. Right. So we just completed a project on e skills and ICT professionalism. And one of the things that that project did was to look at the question of what is a professional? Yeah? It's actually a very difficult question to answer. Yeah? Especially as we go around Europe and we discover that the word professional doesn't necessarily always translate in the same way into different languages and so on. Yeah? It certainly does into French and I imagine it might do into Italian. But we find that in Germany and the Nordic countries, the word professional ends up meaning quite a different thing. But never mind, we, we, we seek to give this a, a definition, because when we're going to talk about something, it helps that we all agree on what it is that we're talking about. Yeah. So this study uh, determined, basically, or came up with this particular definition in asking people about what the profession was. And the important point about it for the purposes of today was that a professional is somebody who adheres to an agreed code of ethics or conduct and applicable regulatory practices. So that's why, if you like, the uh, Task Force on Professionalism from CEPAS finds itself interested in ethics. Because ethics is one of the four areas which, if we are to hold ourselves as professionals, we have to be paying attention Two, right? Now it's a separate question that I'm going to try and explore over the next few minutes as to what structures, therefore, we need to have in place to help our members to look at this area of uh, ethics. Yeah? But nevertheless, we know it has to be there. So that, I suppose, then brings us to the question of well, why ethics at all? Now many of you have been uh, exploring that question yourselves in the courses that you're doing. Um, but I'm just going to touch on a little bit here because it does matter and it does require us to be able to explain to members of the public, right? Software Engineering Code of Ethics, our first obligation is to the public, what it is our ethics is and what it's about. Um, now, I don't mean to pick on Google but I found this image on the internet and I thought it was rather fun, right? So we all know that the, the uh, if you like, the mantra of Google is to do no evil, yeah? And we might also know that for a brief period, for a couple of years, uh, Google actually had a chief ethics officer, a CEO of a different kind, yeah? <coughs> But many of us of late, you know, following things like 
uh, Google's capture of uh, personal data when they were looking for uh, Wi-Fi codes on Street View, even their capture of images with Street View, and things like the Google Car, things like Google Glass. Some people might be wondering whether or not uh, the Google Ethics Department is from the same genre as the Ryanair Customer Care Department. Those of you who might have been lucky enough as well, Ryanair. So, why ethics to me speaks to two questions. One is we've got to be able to answer the question of what does ethics do for us, for the profession? And then the question of, well, why do we have uh, ethics codes at all? And, and these are difficult questions, I think, both to ask and indeed uh, to answer. Um, so, we are surrounded, I think, by ethical conundrums. I, I was going to originally say dilemmas, but I think conundrums, puzzles, things that we have to explore is, is probably a better metaphor. So, I have been nearly the best part of 30 years uh, in IT in one form or another, either as students over here or working in the profession and so on. And I've seen an enormous amount of change. We've become used to the idea that IT is changing the landscape very, very quickly. Yeah? To the extent now that uh, I think in recent times we're facing questions that 20 years ago we wouldn't even have thought could possibly arise. And in fact, last year, or, or last month, or last week, or even yesterday, yeah, today we face questions that yesterday we couldn't have thought of. I mean, who would have thought that we would have to worry about unliking people on Facebook? And the questions that that poses. poses yeah? Who would have thought 20 years ago, as the internet was beginning to uh, crystallize uh, into something useful, that we'd need to worry about things like the intellectual property of the music industry, or the film industry, and so on, and the software industry itself. And that versus open source. Yeah? Who would have thought only five years ago that we would have to start worrying about digital property after death? Who owns my iPhone, my iTunes library? Yeah. At the moment it turns out that I don't. I'm only borrowing it until I die, even though I've paid it. Yeah. And of course, in recent times, with Facebook changing its approach to uh, privacy for those people who are lucky enough to be under the age of 18, uh, and the questions that that poses for us uh, as a society. So there's an awful lot going on. And that rapid change, as Simon already mentioned, is outpacing the capacity of governments, regulators, and so on to actually deal with it from a legal perspective. Yeah. And I think as professionals as well, we want to aspire to more than just the question of the legality. Yeah. I think we want to be a little bit better than that because Anybody who obeys a speed limit knows that a legal requirement is merely a target. Yeah, that's what standards become. It becomes a tick box. Right? And again, if I can go back to what Simon said, uh, the choosing the right thing is one half of it, but choosing the right thing for the right reason uh, is another. Yeah? And sometimes our ethics is compatible with the law, and sometimes our ethics might be incompatible so ethics can be a very, very different thing for us. And the other thing that we have to face now as a community of IT is the question that, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, IT was a box of flashing lights that sat in the corner humming away with tape drives spinning around in the middle of Star Trek. And if you watch the original series of Star Trek, you're familiar with that image of IT. Now, it's on the street, it's in people's phones, it's in hands, it's, 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 it's in the consumer domain, and that, of course, creates a wide range of different questions that we have to consider. And, of course, I'm also talking, quite specifically, 
about professional ethics. Yeah? So the uh, IT um, skills, the skills and, and uh, framework study that I spoke of earlier, it spoke of the idea that a defining aspect of a profession involves adhering to the professional ethical conduct, right? And this was to uh, make us compatible with, with, with other professions. Uh, I'm asking the question of whether IT professional ethics is different from regular ethics, societal ethics. And is IT ethics different from professional ethics? And is the ethics that a web designer needs to be familiar with different from the ethics that a, uh, a system designer of uh, automated drones needs to be familiar with? And the answer to those is both of both yes and no, and it's far too early to say in any event what those things might look at. So what exactly is ethics? Mm, okay. Far be it for me as a non-expert to try and pin this question down. Uh, however, it is important, like I said earlier, that when we discuss a topic, we should all at least agree what it is we're trying to talk about to some degree. Um, so I'll try and just give you my view of what ethics is, and then you can compare it with your view then we can see how the conversation progresses from there, right? So if we get to grassroots here, ethics is variously described as telling right from wrong. Uh, if we go back to the likes of Aristotle and so on, it's, it's, it's how best we live. But my favorite expression of what ethics is comes from a guy called Robert Vaughan of SEMA. And he describes following an ethical code as doing the right thing when nobody else is looking. Yeah? Now that takes us a little bit away from the pillory, of course, because the pillory is only doing the right thing under the threat of having vegetables thrown at us. But nevertheless, what we aspire to, of course, is that we're going to do the right thing, not because of the threat, but despite the threat. Now we also have to look at the question of ethics in the context of where that ethics sits, right? Because my ethics is going to be different from your ethics. Maybe not in its gross sense, but certainly in some of the particulars. So I come from Ireland. Yeah? And if we take medical ethics as an example, in Ireland, uh, we had a situation where uh, abortion is a very difficult subject, but it's very difficult to come by. And it's very, very closely regulated and so on. Other people come from countries where medical, medical ethics says that abortion is a treatment. And we can either disagree or agree with that, that doesn't really matter. My point is merely to illustrate that even in something as ancient as the question of medical ethics, we don't have to go too far to find that there are differences. Um, for me then, as well, in looking at ethics, um, maybe I'll be slightly controversial here, because my view, I suppose, is that I would view I would view ethics as what we use to be able to predict how other people will behave. Yeah? Uh, in other words, we all know when somebody has broken the law. That's an easy enough thing to establish. Ethics is a bit more Gray. And one of the interesting things when we look at the question of ethics is we tend to be a whole lot more outraged 
And somebody has violated our personal sense of ethics. And when somebody has broken the law. Yeah, we're all willing to forgive somebody speeding on a motorway. And that sort of thing. Yeah? But when somebody takes money from a charity box, that is seriously bad. Yeah? And this is one of the areas where we use ethics, our understanding of ethics. When a professional body puts up and publishes a professional code of conduct that expects its members to obey, it's there to give people the capacity to predict how the members of that society will do their work. Yeah. Another aspect, perhaps. In the ICT Frameworks project, which we recently completed, one of the strands of that was looking at ethics because it's an important point of professionalization. And it basically discern that there were three issues that arose in looking at ethics. One was the question of whether or not it's possible for there to be a universal code of ethics. Okay. And I've already alluded to the fact that we don't have to travel too far to find situations where our outlook is quite different. So we had to address the question of what might be a universal code. The next one was, well, what should be in our ethics? What sorts of things should we actually be talking about? What sorts of situations should we be putting in our ethics to illustrate, <coughs> illustrate um, the sorts of things that professionals should do? And the third issue is my period. It's my sanctions. It's what to do when ethics aren't being abided by. <coughs> So let's first look at the question of who's ethics? Because ethics, ethics is like beauty to some degree. Yeah? It depends on where you're standing. It depends on what you're looking at. Yeah? There are many, very many large employers who have their own codes of ethics. So Amazon has one, IBM has one, uh, I'm sure the uh, Instituto here has a code of ethics and behaviour that it expects students to behave by and so on. One of the interesting things in our study um, was to discover, of course, that there's no agreement on what these things should look like. There's no agreement on how they should be expressed. There's no agreement uh, on, on the nature of the things that should be contained. And this, makes uh, looking at ethics, particularly a comparison of different uh, ethics, uh, a bit of a conundrum uh, for us because you know, they can be interpreted in different ways. If I look at an example of myself in the question of whose ethics, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a relatively complicated person. I, mean, I wear many different hats. So I am, at the same time, a member of the British Computer Society. I'm also a fellow of the Irish Computer Society, and both of those organizations have their own codes of ethics. Uh, I was for a long time an employee of a large Japanese multinational, and it had its code of ethics. And from time to time, that organization would send me to go and work in other organizations as a consultant. And of course, when you go to work in another organization, you're expected to adhere to their code of ethics. And now I've got four different codes of ethics running around my mind, and I'm trying to figure out which one of those am I supposed to be obeying. Yeah. So whose code of ethics is uh, a challenge? An actual fact, from my perspective, if I put my hat of the chair of the task force in CEPAS back on, what I'm actually talking about is our code of ethics, right? In other words, the members of a professional body, because if I go back to my point, the code of ethics tells us how we expect other people to behave. When we admit people into a professional institution, one of the things that we want to be able to do is to say, look, here's how you're going to behave. If you're going to behave this way because it reflects it's the right thing to do, yeah? but it also reflects well 
on the society that you're a member of, and of course, because I'm also a member of that society, it reflects well on me, and I don't want to be, you know, blackened if you misbehave. Yeah. So it's ours, and one of the things that we have to work with do then is to sit down uh, as members of these institutions and try and figure out what does that mean for us. Yeah? And we have to be brave again in doing that because quite so quite often when we look at uh, codes of ethics, what we're really looking at are the codes of ethics that have been written by the directors or the board or the advisory panel or the committee not by the actual members, and I think that is, a, is an ethical challenge, perhaps, um, in its own right. The next question, then, is what ethics? <coughs> what needs to be included? And I know there's been quite a lot of work. Oh, sorry, I don't know if you can read that cartoon. We'll go over the website later. <coughs> Basically, in this cartoon, I don't know if this is syndicated here in Italy, uh, Calvin in the Hall, right? Uh, but the little guy is sort of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm done with ethics. I, you know, uh, it should be every man for himself. And then the tiger here basically pushes it into the mud. And the little guy says, uh, I only meant for me. Everybody else still has to obey the ethics and do the right thing. Yeah. And that's another question to ask because ethics is something that we expect ourselves to behave and of course it's something that we expect everybody else to be doing at the same time and perhaps we have an expectation that all those people are doing it more than we are yeah because we know it's all right for us to you know be a bit gray or a bit vague anyway there has been an awful lot of work looking at ethics there are things like the toronto resolution there are things like the computer ethics institute's ten commandments uh, there is uh, IFIP, another international body that spent a great deal of time looking at this question. Uh, the Software Engineering Code of Ethics that Simon spoke about is now part of an ISO IEC standard and so on. There are lots of things there, but they're all very particular. Some of them are very old, and yet here we are in 2013, and ethics moves on, challenges moves on, and so on. So we have to be continually asking the question about what ethics. And that means that we have to ask ourselves some challenging questions, right? So, naturally, we all will say, much like the Software Engineering Code of Ethics, which says that the first obligation of the software engineer is to the public, right? We have to have the first do no harm clause, the kind of <coughs> IT equivalent of our Hippocratic Oath. And because ethics mostly arises from the potential that harm might be caused. Yeah. We need to ask things like, well, how do IT practitioners contribute to, if you like, the good life of others? In other words, how do IT practitioners contribute to a successful society? And who exactly are the public? We need to ask, you know, again, if I put all my hats back on, BECS, ICS, my employer, etc., my client, and so on. You know, to whom exactly am I ethically obliged? Is it my employer? Is it my client? Is it uh, my immediate manager who's given me a set of requirements to follow? Is it the customer of my customer who's going to be using the product, and so on? Where does my boundary lie? And how can I possibly accommodate all of these questions? <coughs> in my consideration of what I, here I am writing a piece of Java and all these things are buzzing around my mind. I get paralyzed with, with fear that somebody is going to throw vegetables at me. Um, anyway, I digress. And then there's the remit of ethics. Um, by remit, I mean its boundaries, its extent, how far out do we have to consider things. So, sorry, I'm not picking on Google, but again, it's a really good diagram, right? This is the Google car, right? And as you know, the Google car is a car that is driven by a piece of software. A piece of software that some very, very clever software engineers have written. But this thing goes out on its own, right? So what are, I'm not going to do it 
question and answer exercise here, but let's just throw out the question, what are the ethical considerations of the Google car? Let me put that more concretely. What happens when the Google car kills somebody? Right? Whose responsibility is that? Is it the owner of the car? Is it the passenger of the car? Is it the fault of the person who got killed? Is it the builder of the car? Is it Google? Is it the software engineers? Yeah, this becomes a little bit like the National Rifle Association in America. Their argument that it's not guns that kill people, it's people that kill people. Yeah, that's a very, very philosophical point to try and address when somebody's lying dead on the street. Yeah? So one of the things that we have to be conscious of in our ethics right, is ethics have indirect consequences for us. And other professions are much more direct. Right? If I'm a surgeon operating on somebody, my ethical question is now. My ethical question is the patient. It's not the patient's family. It's not what treatment might come down the track. It's what I have to do now and whether or not that is ethical. With software, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Because software, as we know, has got emergent consequences. Things that we never dreamt of are arising because of our software. And how can we forewarn ourselves about that? Yeah? How can we change the situation that if the accounting system is broken, it's not the software engineer that gets fired, it's the accountant that gets fired. Yeah? We need to worry about those sorts of things. So, what agreement to whom is the individual software engineer responsible? Their boss? The customer, the end user, I suppose, all of that, yeah, at the same time, in different ways, needs to be considered. And then we have our sanction. So I'm back to my pillory, but now I have a professional society. They've all got top hats on. Is a professional gentleman throwing vegetables? at one of the other professional gentlemen with the pillory. Um, it's now a condition of education in engineering in the United States that you have to do a course of ethics. And I'm very happy to see that here in the Polytechnico you also do a course of ethics. Because it's a very, very rare sort of thing. Right? Now the implication of that for anybody undertaking the course of ethics, is that you're both expected to learn and to live up to these ethical standards as a condition of your inclusion in that profession. Right? But what happens when you don't? There are lots and lots of codes of ethics and there are very, very few disciplinary committees. What happens? What's the meaning? Right? Is this, does this become the pillory, not for the member, but for the member society, but the professional institution? Yeah, is it a humiliation that we would put up a code of ethics and have no means of actually making it have actual meaning or value uh, to society? Uh, an interesting uh, observation by uh, Jacques Berner uh, of IFIP quite some time ago. Uh, he said that codes of ethics, like laws, tends to keep the honest person honest and have little impact on those who choose to ignore them. Yeah? And that, I suppose, is where we in the profession put ourselves up on the pedestal. Yeah? That's where we start to get shot down in our consideration of the codes of ethics. So, that was a bit of a long ramble. I'll put my CEPAS hat back on and tell you a little bit about what we are doing to help us try and tackle some of these questions. Because it's a long journey. One of the things that we have done is we've decided to gather, so I don't expect you to read what's on that, it's, it's, I'm, I'm just illustrating what the web page looks like. We've gathered together the codes of ethics of the different member societies of Europe and we've linked to them on our web page. Right? And we've also started in that to try and draw a distinction between codes of ethics and codes of conduct, right? 
Because quite often these two things are put together, and in reality they're quite different things. Yeah? So in the top half are those codes which we believe to be codes of ethics, and at the bottom half are those codes that we believe to be codes of conduct. And we're very grateful for the cooperation of the member societies to allow us to do this, because the, one of the ways we can start to tackle and answer these questions is to understand what's important in different uh, situations. So you can go away and have a look at that, it's a very useful resource. Uh, the other thing that we are uh, doing, and we're doing this from a professional ethics from member societies standpoint, is we are going to host uh, a micro-conference during next spring. And a micro-conference is a conference where we invite experts, right? So here's a point now where I'm asking you guys for help. I want experts to come to my conference. So I want you to sort of put your hands up, not immediately, right? But you can get me by email. Put your hands up and say to me, look, here's this guy, I know him, and he really has an awful lot of important things to say about ethics in the context of IT and the profession. But we want, to, we want these, to bring these people together, we want to throw some provocative questions out on the floor, and we want to see how the conversation goes and be able to uh, talk to that. We want to talk about what are the basic elements of a code of ethics. We want to talk about whether IT professional ethics is somehow in any way different from ethics at all, whether the question is about technology, whether it's about information technology being a different thing. What's more important? Is it the ethical principle or is it the sanction? What delivers the most value? And other types of questions. So please, your nomination is gratefully accepted and we can turn this into something that's going to be really, really useful. And I'll leave you there. Thank you very much. And the answer is when you like questions. I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you spoke about. Well, okay, okay. Okay. You spoke about the um, the company the company IT ethics. Yeah. And I was wondering one of the biggest problems I found to now in some companies are related to the. Um, to the ownership of the devices. I mean, every company right now asks you to work from your your home, from another country, everywhere in the world. And the big problem is that, okay, this is my cell phone, and in the same time, it's also the cell phone of my company. And, okay, I'm the system administrator, and I have to deal with it. I have to, to commit the, the software in order to not share the personal and the um, and the, and, the, and the company data, and I agree on that. But at the same time, it's a commitment also from the from the from the worker. It's not bad because he needs to not share the data that are in the same device. So this is also ethic, isn't it, for you? Thanks. I I fully sympathise with your predicament. Um, for exactly all of those reasons. I, I don't share my device with the companies that I work for. Yeah, but it happens sometimes. I mean, if, yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah, if I'm the owner of the device and the company gives me another device, then I have two devices with me. Yeah, like, absolutely. absolutely. And it's a big challenge and I don't think there are any, I don't think there are any good answers for this. This, this is a really good illustration, actually. This, what we're talking about here is, is the bring your own device phenomenon that's happening now because IT organizations look at that as a way of lowering costs and so on. And this is an area, to be quite honest, where, 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 where technology has raced far, far ahead of our ability to understand what the implications are, right? Because now you, 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 you have a situation where there can be customer data on your device, but there's also your own data on your device, right? And your customer has access to your, not your customer, your employer has access to your device and so on. So what happens if the device is lost, yeah? Plus, most of the rules around bring your own device don't even begin to address the question of, well, you know, okay, I can't, I'm not supposed to have customer data on my device in case it gets lost, but that doesn't stop me emailing it to somebody. 
yeah? And then the email goes through Google. And now I'm exporting personal data to the United States, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm not really answering your question, but I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, it's a good example of, you know, us needing to catch up and, you know, needing to sit down and, and, and really try and decide what's going on. Professional that nowadays are you know, the, the chief information officer um, in the many companies are now facing the issue of uh, should we go to the cloud, should we fire all the IT organizations, shut down the computer room, etc. This deep practical question <laughs> that they have in their real life, it's uh, moving all those ethical issues on another place or we, you know. This I think this is a very, very important point, actually, the whole question of cloud, outsourcing, even bring your own device and so on. Uh, one of the principles of the law right, is that you can't outsource your obligation. Right? And I think, I think the same thing applies to ethics. Just because I'm outsourcing various bits and pieces, I cannot outsource my own ethical obligation. It's still up to me to make sure that I'm upholding and meeting the various ethical considerations. Now yes, when we go to the cloud, when we outsource, when we change the way we're doing this, we're creating new ethical questions. Absolutely. But it's still my responsibility to face up to those, to address those, to put my hand up and so on, rather than simply to say, well, it's their problem now, because it's not, it's still, it's still my problem, I still have the responsibility. Excellent question. The question was, how can I be responsible if I don't know? Right now, the law has an answer to that straight away, which I'm sure we're familiar with. Well, I don't know whether it applies on continental European, but in, 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 in Ireland and in England and the United States, we say that ignorance of the law is no defense, right? You broke the law, you go to jail, right? Ethics, probably a little bit different, but one of, one of the ways of addressing that type of question is to try and answer some of the questions that I'm posing. So, if I am a member of a member society, of a professional institution, that professional institution. What I want to do is I want to make sure the professional institution has a published code of ethics, right? So that I can go there and I can know. And one of my duties as a professional, of course, and this will be contained in our code of ethics and our code of conduct, is that I should familiarize myself with these things. Yeah? And I should try to understand where uh, where to go for information, where to go for help, and even in those situations like I was describing, where I've got four different things going on in my mind, what's affecting the particular situation where I work, right? So let's say, for example, I am working on a, a database system in a medical area, so now I need to be concerning myself with medical ethics, I need to be concerning myself with data privacy ethics, and I need to be concerning myself with software engineering ethics. And my code of ethics as an IT professional would make me aware of my obligation to go and seek the relevant advice in all of those areas. Yeah? But me knowing that requires that schools of computing like this one are educating our students in having that understanding and that approach. Yeah, it's a very difficult thing for us to retrofit afterwards if people haven't started from there. But we have to start somewhere, and I'm glad that here in the Polytechnic campus that uh, that's already begun. Um, when you talk about sanctions, it sounds like you were. And I, and I sort of mentioned it as well, the, the idea that it's, it's about losing one's membership. 
has, has your body thought about, uh, it's a bit like when, when you get, um, when you're caught for speeding, yeah. you have a choice of either having points on your license, which means eventually you'll use, lose your license to drive, um, or you go on, on a speed awareness course where you are educated so that you will not do it again. Has your body thought of actually part of the sanctions actually putting in place for existing professionals the idea of some education program so it isn't just students that do tackle first, it is the more mature professional. The question of sanctions <laughs> is fraught with difficulty. Um, one of the things that we already have discovered is depending on which European country you're in, the question of sanctions has entirely different implications. Um, so first of all, I mean, from, from SIBA's perspective, one of the first things we have to do is get agreement on the question of whether or not sanctions are relevant and need to exist. And then we start looking at the nature of sanctions. But I think it's fair to say that the nature of the sanction has to depend on the gravity of the crime, right? And it's going to be up to different member societies and professional institutions to kind of do their best to codify that to express it in a way that's easily digestible to, uh, to people. And I would certainly agree that we should have, and, and not just in the case of infractions, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in my copious quantities of spare time, I'm a scout leader as well, right? So I have to be up to date in child protection, I have to be up to date in first aid, I have to be up to date in a wide of things, and I have to refresh that continually because these things change. I think the professional institutions need to be refreshing continually the awareness of ethics, both in its base sense, in, in the terms of the, the core of what the ethics need to be, but also in discussing in an ongoing and public way the new ethical questions that are emerging. So that, to answer that lady's question over there again, we're creating a resource that creates awareness. Yeah. Now, you know, a minor infraction of ethics, whatever that might mean, might result in some minor punishment. Maybe we do like football clubs and we find people, I don't know. Yeah? Maybe we force people to accumulate so many uh, continuous professional development points in order to clear their record. And I suppose in the ultimate case, maybe, yeah, we throw people out. And then we have a different ethical question, which is, what right have we to interrupt somebody's livelihood? Big question. It's only, it's only lunch time. You're all right. Yeah, one more question. Um, I'm thinking about the contrast you made uh, between the confidentially and the whistleblowing. And um, I'm thinking about which role the whistleblowers can uh, play in a in the um, internet biosphere and the information and uh, maybe um, as a, a punishment of the um, uh, breaking of, of a code of ethics or, or the whistleblowers should um, deal uh, with the uh, code of ethics too? That's another fraught and dangerous question. I'm sure we're thinking of uh, the likes of Mr. Snowden, God love him, languishing in Russia. Um, and the world, of course, is divided into people who think he was a hero, and the other half of the world which thinks he's a criminal in need of sending him to jail. And I won't tell you which side of that that I'm sitting on. Um, but I mean, whistleblowing. Falls down. It's, it's, it's the same question as, 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 as the one of sort of saying, look, I'm in a situation where I've discovered that there's an ethical problem, right? Now, for Mr. Snowden, his ethical problem was that the NSA was doing things that, in his view, it shouldn't have been doing, right? And that's an example, again, of differences in ethics, because his perspective was they shouldn't have, and the bosses of the NSA felt it was entirely ethical that they should be doing what they were doing in order to preserve us from God and squat. Like a difficult question. Um, I think this is a point where, as IT professionals, we need to start digging into Simon's bravery again, right? 
if this was a medical question, right? If this was, if this was a medical scenario, and I can't for the life of me think of something equivalent, but let's just imagine it's a medical scenario, right? Then the whole question of medical ethics is very well formalized, right? It is possible for a medical practitioner to go to their medical ethics committee and to discuss the question with them, yeah, without affecting their career, and then to decide on a course of action, at least they know what they can do. We, we simply don't have that in IT, and I think it'll be quite a long time before we do. Yeah. So Mr. Snowden had to undertake a brave step, perhaps a foolhardy step, but a brave step. And in a very smaller sense, normal employees will have to do that as well. I mean, one of the elements that interested me on the British Computer Society's code of conduct, right, was the idea that I shouldn't undertake work that I didn't know how to do. Okay? Now, on the face of it, that seems very reasonable. And we do this all the time in IT. I don't know how to do this. That's okay. I send you on a course. You'll never have any week. Yeah? And nobody puts their hands up to say, oh, I'm struggling with this. Yeah? And maybe we should. Now, is that a contravention of ethics? A very teeny tiny version of Mr. Snowden? Possibly it is. Where it gets to the law, which again is Mr. Snowden's conundrum, I think we have to say that unequivocally we should be obeying the law. Yeah? Which makes it very difficult for the whistleblower. And it makes it very difficult in situations where we talk about, uh, you know, repressive regimes and so on, where whistleblowers are doing good civil work that we would regard as ethical, but their ethical context is entirely different from ours. Yeah. So again, I'm sorry, there's no right answer. Yeah. But if we manage to progress to a situation where our implementation of ethics is beginning to get into a mode a bit like legal ethics or medical ethics, where we can actually discuss questions, where we can actually float them, where we can actually see what's right and wrong here, uh, then perhaps we'll be able to deal with these sorts of situations a little bit better than throwing people into exile under a threat of disappearing to Guantanamo Bay for the rest of their lives. How was that? Thank you. Yeah. Grazie a tutti.